just released your book on the history and uh, grape varieties of Switzerland. Can you give us a brief kind of history of Switzerland in terms of grape growing? Okay, Switzerland is a treasure trove for ampelographers. Before going through history, I need to give some numbers of the actual situation. We grow officially 200, more than 250 grape varieties on a mere 15,000 hectares. It's huge. It's probably a world record. It's really a lot. Out of these more than 250, I have counted 80 that are called indigenous. And out of these 80, um, 59 of them are crossings, recent crossings obtained in uh, research stations. And only 21 are really what I call heritage grape varieties. And these heritage grape varieties cover 6% of the country. For me, these numbers, okay, it's a lot of numbers, but I think it's, <laughs> it, it, it's a bit shocking because what represents your own history, <clears throat> your, your heritage, your identity, I mean, when I say your, I, I speak about Switzerland, it's only 6% of what you produce. For me, it's not enough. Why do you think that is? Why it has become so? Mm. Oh, well, that, that, that's also a little bit historical, um, historically related. That's what we used to cultivate before the mid-19th century. We had introduced um, ancient varieties like Pinot, like Savagnin, like uh, Gueblan, uh, Muscat, but we, we used to cultivate our own varieties. At the turn of uh, the um, 19th, 20th century, like every other region, we had to struggle with phylloxera. Phylloxera that uh, was attacking the roots of European varieties when people had to replant their vineyards onto American rootstocks. They had to make a decision. Do we continue cultivating what the father, grandfather, grand-grandfather was cultivating? Or do we choose something that is easier to sell, easier to cultivate, more resistant to disease, and more productive? That's what they did. So they replaced almost everything that was indigenous with easier varieties. And we have the result more than 100 years later. But Switzerland has a very, very long history in terms of uh, uh, viticulture. Of course, we know that the, the Romans have introduced some, in some places, the viticulture, maybe introduced some varieties, but we have no evidence. And we have evidence that before the Romans, the Celts were cultivating vineyards in Switzerland, especially in Valais, where we are right now with this, this video. Um, and it dates back to 800 BC. And since 800 BC until today, we had a continuous uh, growing of, uh, of wine in Switzerland, Valais and uh, different regions. So we have a, a long history. We are not a new country. Why people do not know us, it's another question. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you think that many people don't know about Swiss wines? Because we only export approximately 1% of what we produce. We are good wine drinkers. And what we produce is not enough for us. Roughly, the numbers fluctuate, but roughly, we drink 40% of what we drink is Swiss and 60% is imported, which means we need to import wine in order to satisfy um, all the, the consumption. The corollary of, of, of it is that we don't have enough to export. And when you export 1%, sometimes not even the best. It's not a good way to make yourself known abroad. So when you go abroad, first of all, you must find someone who knows where Switzerland is. <laughs> and then many people are astonished to know that you grow wine there? I mean, you make wine in Switzerland? Amazing. So yes, we do. And we, we make very, very good wines. Uh, I'm not saying this because I'm Swiss. <laughs> 
I promise. Uh, but, but really, we, we, we do world-class wines, but very difficult to find. And we are trying to increase the export, especially in terms of, of image, to show the world that Swiss wine is good, and also to convince Swiss people that are not uh, sure that it's good, that yes, other people say it's so. <laughs> so it's good. Excellent. And let's think about if you can explain to us the Switzerland as a kind of grape growing country in terms of its climate, its terroir as such, and what varieties work best here in terms of native varieties or otherwise? So Switzerland geologically and uh, from a climate point of view is very, very diverse. It was difficult to categorize the different types of wines and uh, we ended up with um, identifying six different regions with their own speciality, their own geography, I uh, would, would say their own terroir, but within each region the terroir is extremely diverse. So the, the most important in terms of, of, of uh, surface is Valais um, in the middle of the Alps. Then you have the German-speaking part of Switzerland, all together. It's a, a big mix. You have Graubünden, you have Zurich, uh, and so on. The second one in terms of, uh, of um, uh, area. Then Vaux, close to Lake Limon. We call it Limon. It's Geneva, Geneva Lake, where they are mostly famous for the Chasselas. Then you have Geneva, Ticino, and um, last but not least, Neuchâtel Trois Lacs. These are the six different regions. And in all these regions, they have their own specialities. In Valais, because it's the, the most important in, term, in terms of quantity, it, it's, a, it's an internal valley of the Alps with a continental climate. It's a lateral valley. And it has been isolated geographically from many other regions. And we, we represent historically that kind of region in the Alps who used to live in Autarky, and we have developed our, our own breeds of wheat, for example, our own breeds of cows. And also, we did not develop, but they developed by, by, they developed by themselves, our own varieties. And out of the 21 heritage varieties that I have uh, in my book, 14 of them come from Valais. The most um, praised and famous is this one that we're drinking right now. <laughs> it's Arvin, or Petit Arvin, which is a very aromatic, uh, powerful white with a high acidity that is um, capable of making world-class wine either dry or sweet. We have in red, we have Cornalin, that is very famous. I call it Rouge du Pays, it's the historical name. It's very difficult to make, but when it's well done, it's fantastic. Then if, you, if we take the different regions, in Vaux, of course, it's the, the temple of Chasla. And uh, in this region, they, they, don't, they, they never mention the grape variety. It's too easy. Everybody knows it's Chasla. So they mention the, the appellations, either the, the, the village names or the um, appellation like Desalais, Calamin, which are the two Grand Cru. You have uh, Saint-Saforin, Epesse, Morge, etc. Then I go geographically then. Uh, in Geneva, they do not have any particular variety. So they had to import some of them. They are very good at aligoté, which comes from Bourgogne, Burgundy. And uh, they have uh, developed a, a lot of gamma ray, which is a recent crossing obtained in the Swiss Federal Research Station Agroscope. Then if you go to Neuchâtel, they have a long tradition of Pinot. They, were, they are very close to, to Burgundy uh, in terms of geography. And they were the first to introduce Pinot in Switzerland together with, with, with Vaux from different regions. And one of the very old Pinot was selected in Neuchâtel and still today we call it Cortaillot. It's the name of a village. It's the selection that they took from Burgundy. So I would say for the Neuchâtel Trois Lacs, mostly Pinot and of course Chasla that is everywhere. In the German part of Switzerland, I'm, I'm doing clockwise, in the <laughs> German part of Switzerland, um, it's very diverse. You have a huge number of, of varieties. Some people go to um, recent hybrids because there is a tendency to have uh, uh, people with organic, biodynamic. 
and they don't like to put chemicals, so they have PV. Have you heard of PV? Okay, I will try to pronounce it. It's Pilzwiderstandsfähige Rebsorten, which means grape varieties that are resistant to fungal diseases. Okay, <laughs> that was easier. <laughs> and and, and they, they, uh, they call it PV, it's the abbreviation, it's much better. So there are a lot of people who, who are into this, which is good for the environment. And they grow a lot of hybrids, which for me personally is not always satisfying. Some of them are good, but it can be difficult. They also have traditional varieties like Reuschling, which is um, cultivated around the Lake Zurich, especially in Mailand. And then if you go further south, you go to Graubünden, which is a very famous wine region. Pinot is excellent. It, it's one of the best places for Pinot. You have Neuchâtel Graubünden. And they have a local variety that I love very much, which is called Completa. It's extremely rare, only four hectares total in, uh, in Switzerland and in the world, and mostly grown in, uh, in Graubünden. And it's a white wine that is uh, very uh, high in acidity, but has a, a full body, a complex nose. Um, it's a wine that when, when you, you taste it, you smell it, you think, oh, that's a sweet wine. You taste it, that's dry <laughs> and super acidic. I love it. And then we finish the tour. We go to Ticino, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, where they used to grow a local variety called Bondola, which I like very much. It, it's, a, it's a red, it's a rustic red with the, um, s uh, nice tannin, chewy tannins. Not so complex, but it goes very well with food, with salami. But it has been completely replaced after Philoxera by Merlot. And it has become, I mean, Ticino has become the region for Merlot in Switzerland. And they want to, or they have been wanting to compete with the, with the Saint-Emilion and uh, generally Bordeaux region. <laughs> and thank you, that was impressive. Um, before my next question, can you define the difference for us between a native variety and an international variety? Or what are the, dif or what are the categories that you would give? Okay, so these categories could be applied to any wine region. I have made different categories for, for the Swiss grape varieties. The first one is indigenous. These are the varieties that are native, that, are, that were born on the site. Either we have evidence that they were born here. For example, if I can find the parents through DNA profiling, if I, can, if, if I can show that variety C was born from parents A and B, and parents A and B are from Switzerland, then C is Swiss. It was the same as f uh, f for people. Even if A and B, say A is French and B is Italian, and they met in Switzerland, would it still be considered an indigenous variety? We have to. Okay. Indigenous, from the Latin um, etymology, means born on the site. So we, we kind of apply the American law. I mean, if you're born in, on, in the American soil, you're American. Okay. <laughs> so it's the same. Then um, you have traditional varieties. And uh, the ones I call traditional are the ones that were culti cultivated before 1900. I, I chose this date because uh, it's more or less the date where uh, Phylloxera came to, Swiss to Switzerland and where they had to replace all the vines with the, with the other varieties. So the traditional ones were introduced a long time ago. If you think of Pinot, it was present in, uh, in Vaux and Neuchâtel already in the 17th century. Uh, we know it's not from there. We know it's from northeastern France to be, to be general. We have, in Valais, we have a grape called Haida, which is the local name of Savagnin Blanc or Tramina for the German speaking. We know it does not come from here, but it was here since a long time. The first document uh, speaking about Haida is 1540. So many centuries of, of presence. So these ones I call traditional. And the other ones that were introduced after 1900, I call them allogenous. So these are the three cate categories, and we can use these categories in many different countries. Can you repeat the third category? Allogenous. It's the opposite of indigenous. Okay, 
phylogenous. I haven't heard that word before. Um, fantastic. And a quick question. In, in my mind, an indigenous variety could simultaneously happen in two countries. Would that be correct? Or is every crossing very unique? If, if we had... Ah. I think you understand my question. At first <laughs> I, I, I was hesitating, but then, then, I, then I understood. Every crossing is unique. Okay. Um, just like us, every grape variety has two parents. And if two parents have several children, none of them is identical. Even identical twins are not 100% identical, genetically speaking. And if you know some of them, they have different characters as well. So it's the same for grapes. The two parents having uh, crossing at, at different times at different places will produce different children. That's for sure. Perfect. Um, so what is your thoughts, or what are your thoughts, in terms of um, whether wine regions like Switzerland, which has 250 varieties, should be pushing its indigenous varieties or should be adapting to the market with allogenous varieties? Personally, I would be more in favor of pushing forward the indigenous varieties, the heritage varieties, for a simple reason. We are the, the only ones to have them. They had centuries to adapt to the terroir, and we don't have any competitor. So this is what I would put forward. It doesn't mean that you must plant any indigenous variety anywhere, because all the um, terroir conditions are not suit suitable for all these varieties, but we should put the accent on this. Yet, the producers are free, free people in a free country, and they can try anything they want. Um, they also very much like to be different from the neighbor. So, I will introduce this variety that is a bit weird, but I will be the only one to make it. I said, okay, okay. We have no experience. Maybe you will make a good wine, maybe not. And, but even if you make a good wine, how will it compare to the same wine from another country? And even, even if it does, how much will it sell compared to another country? Because Switzerland is a, is a very ex expensive country. So for me, I think we are losing the message. And we are confusing the, the consumers by having such a diversity. And instead of, of, of wanting to produce everything you can, just focus on what you know how to do well. That would be my message. <laughs> Excellent. And when was the heyday for diversity in Switzerland and indeed kind of thinking on a global scale in terms of the, the number of different varieties? Was it just before Phylloxera or or here, have we seen a recovery, or do you think it was far before that? Oh, no, 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 no. Before Phylloxera, um, in, the, in the book you were kindly men mentioning before, which is only in French, by the way, <laughs> Cépage Suisse, <laughs> Histoire et Origine, I cannot say, say it in English. For now. For now. For now. For now. I hope to have a German <laughs> translation and an English translation next year. In this book, I have a map of what was cultivated in Switzerland before 1850, which give, gives a, a nice picture of what was generally cultivated. And I have only 27 varieties. Some traditional, like Pinot, uh, Savagnin, which is Haida, and many, many indigenous. 150 or 160 years later, the picture has changed completely completely. So I would say that the, um, the heyday of transition started in the early 90s for a simple reason. The um, protection that we used to have in Switzerland with the customs fell down. So they opened the borders for import. At first for reds only, and then a few, a few years later they allowed it for white, because Switzerland was a white wine producing country. So producers were horrified to start to see so many, so many foreign wines on the market, and to compete with them they were much cheaper. They were not used to that. So they 
they thought we need to do something. So some of them said, oh, we, we need to try to plant Chardonnay, we need to try to plant some weird stuff, some obscure stuff. Um, they have introduced hybrids, they have introduced uh, Danat, Mourved and stuff. We try everything. Some others said, oh, let's go back to the roots and we plant the indigenous varieties. And these one have continued. The other ones, uh, I don't know if they will, they will last so long. So it's a, a political decision that triggered the uh, diversity that we have today. And I think that's a bet. I think in 50 or 100 years from now, we will have different schools. One school that I would call old school, to which I would obviously belong, <laughs> will grow the old indigenous heritage variety and that's what I will continue to drink until my death. The other school, which is a tendency in uh, many different countries, will be the most healthy producers for the environment and the people. And they will grow uh, organically, biodynamically, varieties that do not requi would require chemicals. And these will be hybrids, crossings, and uh, that, that kind of PV I was talking about before. But it will be two different worlds, two different markets. And there will be uh, a market and consumers for both of them. Interesting. Great. Now, my last question is the hardest. What is your desert island grape? If you, could only, if you could only drink one grape variety <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> I know what Jancis would answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what would Jancis answer? Riesling. Riesling. <laughs> and how about yourself? <laughs> okay, one grape variety and I must drink it. Okay. Completa. Ooh, nice. <laughs> you have to take all four hectares with you. To <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm afraid, but uh, well, four hectares, um, I can have enough bottles for an island. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.